The Woman of the Mountain Once upon a time, there was an old man called Julbak Baba. Julbak lived in the village of Gure in Turkey, next to Mount Ida. He looked after cows, pigs and geese, and he was well-known and well-liked throughout the village. But Julbak was foolish. Years before, a beautiful woman called Mukaddes had come to Gure, and Julbak fell in love with her straight away. They got married, and for a while after, she would disappear occasionally and come back without an explanation. When Julbak raised the issue with her, she announced that she was pregnant. Julbak, being a foolish man, thought that she had cheated on him, and that the child was from another man but he did not dare say this. One night, when Mukaddes had once again disappeared, he drank so much that he almost passed out. Another man of Gude ran into the bar and shook him, saying, Julbak, your wife is giving birth. Come now. Julbak was so drunk and full of spite that he did not leave the bar and kept drinking while the other villagers helped his wife give birth. If the baby belonged to another man, then why should he help her give birth? She did not survive the labour. Julbak was filled with grief, but it was softened when he saw his daughter. She was as beautiful as her mother, if not more, and as she grew up, she took on an enchanting smile and magnificent long blonde hair, like a field of wheat. When she bent over the well to fill a jug of water, it was as if the sun was raining down from the sky. Julbak decided to name her Sarukuz, which meant beautiful girl, because there was no other way to describe her. It was lucky that Sarukuz was so beautiful and charming, because the other villagers were furious at Julbak for abandoning his wife. One of the men revealed to him that Mukaddis had not been cheating on him. She was actually visiting a witch who lived on nearby Mount Ida, as she had had a vision that her pregnancy would fail, and she wanted to make sure the child survived. Julbak wished to go and see the witch, because he thought she might be able to forgive him for what he did to his wife, but the man informed him that she had died the same night as Sadakuz's birth. As Sadakuz grew older, Julbak's grief became unbearable. He lay awake at night, unable to sleep, thinking of all the things he should have said to her. One night, he dreamt of Mukaddes. She came down from heaven, shining like a star, and said to him, If you truly seek forgiveness, then serve God in my name. Julbak woke up knowing what he had to do. That day was Sarukuz's 15th birthday, and she was already capable of looking after the animals and herself. Sarukuz, I am going on a pilgrimage to ask forgiveness from God. I do not know when I will be back. Look after the animals, and most importantly, be good. Do not let any man step inside this house. But father, why must you leave? She looked just like her mother when she cried, and it broke Julbak's heart. I am sorry, I must. I will think of you the whole way. Sadukuz eventually agreed and said farewell to her father. Julbak pilgrimaged for three years. His journey was full of difficulties, and when he finally arrived, he did not find the forgiveness he sought. Still, Sarukuz remained good, and she never let a man inside the house. All the men of the village lined up to ask her hand in marriage, but she rejected every single one. The men of Gude became furious. The old man has surely died, they said. His daughter would rather die a virgin than let us in. Or perhaps she no longer is one, and is too ashamed to admit it. They spread bitter lies around the village about Sarukuz, but Sarukuz ignored them and looked after the animals. When Julbak finally returned, exhausted from his journey, he headed straight for his home. But on the way, an old woman stopped him. Your daughter has become wicked, she said. 
Oh, yes, she was good at first, but after you were gone for a year, she began to invite men up to Mount Ida in the night and slept with them. She has slept with all the young men in the village at least once. It's a wonder she hasn't fallen pregnant. Julbach did not trust the words of an old gossip, so he asked around the village and quickly found out that the story was true. He was furious. His daughter had not brought the men into his house, but she had done something far worse. I shall forbid her from ever leaving the house again, he said. No, said one of the fathers of the village. Her sins are far too great. We cannot have such women in Gude. Either you kill her, Julbak, or we will do it for you. Julbak was angry, but he could not hurt his own daughter. And from his pilgrimage, he knew that God would not want him to. As he walked home, he thought of a plan. Sarukuz! Father, what a joy it is to see you, Sarukuz cried. She jumped up and wrapped her arms around his neck, and he pushed her off. You disobeyed me. How could you? Sarukuz looked hurt. I don't know what you're talking about. Don't lie to me. I have heard all about what you have done. Take one of the geese in the garden. If you like taking men up to Mount Ida so much, then do the same with the goose. Sarukuz was shocked, but she obeyed her father as usual. She took the goose and they walked up Mount Ida. The path was rocky and dangerous, and it was getting dark, but still they walked and walked. Every now and then, Sarukuz asked, How much more, father? And Julbak replied, Just a little further. Finally, when the night was thick around them, Sarukuz stopped and said, Father, I'm scared. Can't we go home? But Julbak Baba had already gone and Sarakuz was alone in the mountains. That night, Julbak had a dream. Once more, Mukaddes descended from heaven, bright with heavenly light. She was as beautiful as before, but she was not smiling. Mukaddes, my love, do you forgive me? Julbak, you are a foolish old man. You treated our daughter like one of your pigs. Do you really believe the words of those bitter men over your own daughter? Julbak woke up crying, and he awoke crying every day after that, having dreamt of awful things happening to Sarukuz in the mountains. Thieves and landslides and monsters. My beloved daughter! Oh, my beloved daughter! When he walked through Gude, he did not dare look at Mount Ida as it seemed to stare down at him, judging him as his wife had. One day, many years later, Julbak invited a passing merchant to stay with him. He was lonely in his old age, and he often invited travellers in. The merchant told Julbak an interesting story. On the way through Mount Ida, he had gotten lost, and in his moment of complete despair, when he thought he was going to die there, a woman with beautiful blonde hair appeared, followed by a goose. The woman dried his tears and showed him the way down from the mountain before disappearing. Julbak was shocked. His daughter was alive. That night, for the last time, he dreamt of Mukaddes and told her that he planned on going to Mount Ida to find Sarukuz. Be careful, Julbak, she warned him. You may find things out that you were better off not knowing. But Julbak couldn't stop himself. He had to ask his daughter for forgiveness. The next day, he brought his animals to a neighbour and explained what he was doing. Are you mad? said the man. What about the snow, the landslides, the steep cliffs? But Julbak simply shook his head and said, I have to go. For many hours, Julbak climbed Mount Ida until he was well and truly lost. Just as night was falling and he was beginning to feel a powerful hunger, a beam of light shone on the path before him. 
a woman appeared with golden hair like a field of wheat and a goose beside her. Saraku smiled and Julbak felt his heart melt. Father, what a joy it is to see you. I knew you were coming. I have prepared a warm bed and a bowl of soup for you. Come. Sarukus led Julbak to a cabin in the mountains. He was so amazed that he could not speak. She fed him the soup and he fell fast asleep. In the morning, Julbak asked for water to wash himself. He was dirty from the journey through the mountain. He would wash and then beg for Sarukus's forgiveness. There is no water here, father, but I will see what I can do. Sadakus left and returned a few minutes later with a jug of water. Where did you get this water, my beloved daughter? It is too salty to wash with. Sadakus simply smiled. I reached and lifted it from the ocean itself. Jilbak was amazed. It cannot be to do such a thing. Julbak thought back on Sarakuzi's life. It was true that her mother had come to him in dreams, and it was true that Sarakuzi's beauty had always been magical, that no man could resist it. And she had survived on Mount Ida, with only a goose to help her. You are... a saint. You have always been a saint, haven't you? Sarakuzi smiled widely. It is true. My secret has been revealed, and now, thanks to you, I shall join Mother in heaven. Sadakuz exploded with light, and when Julbak opened his eyes again, she was gone. No, my daughter! He fell to the floor and wept. All he had wanted was to ask his daughter for forgiveness, and she had disappeared before he could. Julbak left the mountain taking the jug and the goose as memories of Sarakuz. That night, he wished desperately for Sarakuz and Mukaddes to visit him, but he dreamed no dreams. He woke up crying. Oh, my beloved daughter! But then the goose came up to him and pushed at him with its beak. What do you want? he snapped. The goose pointed at the jug and Julbak went over to look at it. And there, written in the bottom of the jug, were the following words. I forgive you. Love is worth a bit of pain. She knew what she was doing was wrong. She had known the moment she saw him. But love didn't care about what side of a wall you were on, even if she was on the side of the palace gardens and he was stood in the ruined fields. The war had gone on for years, but it only took a moment for her to lose to his eyes. They stared at her through a hole in the wall. She knew he was from the other side. He had the eyes of the others, the enemies. They were so bright that she could see her reflection in them. They came together the night before the end of the war. He sneaked through the back entrance of the palace and found every door in his path unlocked. The corridors led up through the wooden intestines of the place, right up one of the spiny towers, into the princess's bedroom and into her heart. The announcement of defeat came at midday. Soldiers had invaded the palace at night, finding the doors unlocked, and surrounded the king and his wife in their beds. They were killed like pigs, and the princess was brought kicking and crying before the winners. Her lover was nowhere to be seen, and in his place stood a thin, tall man with a moustache like a rat's tail and a smile like a snake's tongue. A nobleman, one of the greatest of his kingdom. He was to marry her and bring together their peoples after the war. She could not refuse but she could rebel. That night, when the palace grounds were silent except for the crying of the cicadas, she sneaked out the window. They had taken care to remove anything from her room that she might hurt herself with, but they had not removed her nails. They were long and beautiful and strong. She stabbed them into the wood, climbing down into the gardens. 
she wandered along the paths, hiding in the shadow of trees, until a warm hand pulled her into the bushes. Your fingers are bleeding, he said, looking at her ruined nails. It is only a bit of blood. Love is worth a bit of pain. Their second night together was twice as passionate as the first, but they were so lost in each other's eyes that they did not see the guards approaching. They were dragged into the palace, and the sleepy nobleman was brought before them, dressed in red silk pyjamas. His snake-like smile had turned poisonous. Burn them both at sunset tomorrow. The princess was locked inside her room. She cried and screamed and begged. Eventually, the nobleman came in, and she fell silent. I know you are hopeless. Your parents are both dead. I cannot forgive you for what you did, but nobody deserves to die alone. I will allow you to see one person tonight, aside from him. She thought for a moment and then said, The old woman who lives alone several streets from here. She is called Doc Rack and she has always been like a grandmother to me. So they brought the old woman before her, who was really a witch. Doc Rack, you must help me. Tonight they will burn me and my lover. Please, use your magic so that we may live. Doc Rack agreed, and in exchange for her help, took the princess's fingernails. They were bent and broken, but the witch insisted. The next day, they had built a great wooden construction in the palace gardens to burn the princess and her lover on. She was tied to it, but her lover was nowhere to be found. She heard whispers around her. It sounded like he had escaped. Her heart was filled with joy, but also fear. For if he was not here, he would not be protected by the witch's spell. Doc Rack, waiting for the man, did not begin her spell until the fire had already been lit. She whispered the words quickly, but the princess had already started crying in pain. Her skin turned red, and her hair curled up, and the witch spoke as fast as she could. Just when it looked like the princess would die, she disappeared. The crowd cried out, the fire was put out, and the palace guards searched everywhere for the princess but she had completely vanished. The witch smiled and returned home. The princess's lover had escaped in the morning. The men guarding him drunk themselves into a stupor, overjoyed with their victory, and fell asleep. He turned away from the city and didn't look back. He ran until he found a horse, and then he rode. He tried to forget about the woman's eyes and his own guilt as he imagined her burning to death alone. Eventually, he reached an inn where he was confident they would not have heard of him. He begged for room and board, in return for labour, and the innkeeper agreed. He drank until he forgot about the fire. Before climbing into bed, he went outside to relieve himself. My dear! He swore and turned around. It was quiet, but he was sure he had heard a voice, a woman's voice. Come closer. Eventually, he made out a shape in the darkness, but there was something wrong with it. Who's there? It's me. His heart stopped. It was the princess. Do you still love me? She said. I... Of course. He fell forward and reached out with his hand. He still couldn't see her properly. But he held her, and she felt warm. Far too warm. He pulled away his hand, and it was wet with blood. It is only a bit of blood, she said. I don't understand. How did you escape? He could see her eyes now, shining in the darkness. Behind him, the innkeeper approached, carrying a torch. And slowly, he began to see the princess. The man screamed and fell to the ground. He scratched at his eyes, but he could not remove the image. Before him, she floated in the air. 
Her black hair was still long and beautiful, and her face was like a china doll, but the rest of her body was gone. Trailing from her neck was her spine, and underneath it a beating heart. Intestines hung below, waving in the night breeze. She smiled at him. What's wrong, dear? It is only a bit of blood. Love is worth a bit of pain. The last thing he saw was those eyes, and the last thing he felt was the beating of her heart pressed against his chest. The Pit and the Pendulum I was sick, sick with the feeling of death. I heard the mutter of those who had questioned me, the Inquisitors. I saw the lips of the black-robed judges, and they were whiter than the paper that I am writing this on. They were thin and tight, and they whispered things I could not hear. I saw seven candles on a table beside me, and they shone like angels. But I knew there was nobody to help me. I thought how sweet death would be, and then the men around me disappeared, and the candles faded into darkness. I woke up and I felt more tired than was possible. My heart beat in my ears and I saw nothing, but slowly the memory of the trial came back to me. The air was thick and warm inside the place, as if I was lying in a cooking pot, and I wondered if this was hell. But I knew this could not be true, because they had not killed me yet. I would know when it happened. I had heard the stories. They burned the lucky ones. Others they cut apart. I stood up and waved my arms around. They passed through the air, but I did not dare move forward, as I thought I might find the walls of a tomb. I blinked and moved my head, hoping to find some small ray of light, but there was nothing but darkness. I slowly began to walk with my arms stretched out. Soon I touched stone, at least what felt like stone, slimy and cold. I tore off a strip of the rough clothes they had given me and placed it on the floor against the wall. Then I moved around, waiting to find the cloth to know the size of the room. It felt like I was walking for hours, but I knew it was merely minutes. Finally, I reached the cloth. It had been about a hundred steps. However, I had found many angles in the wall, and I couldn't guess at what shape the room was. Really, there was no reason to find these things out. They helped me in no way, apart from satisfying my curiosity. But now that I had an idea of the place, I wanted to find out more. I decided to cross the room across the centre. I moved slowly as the floor was slimy. Ten or so steps in, the cloth got caught on my leg and I fell, landing on my face. But my face did not slam into the stone. My chin did, but the rest of my face hung in the air. I reached out with my arm and discovered I had fallen by the edge of a large round pit. I managed to find a small piece of stone and threw it into the pit. There was a long moment of silence, and finally a distant splash. At the same time, I heard a door open and close above me, and there was a brief flash of light in the room. It was only a second, but it allowed me to see the trap they had prepared for me. One more step, and I would have fallen to my death. It was the kind of torture that people spoke of in whispers, and many thought was made up. Nobody really knew what the Inquisition did, but now I could see that the stories of cruel punishment were true, and I was in one of them. The pit would be an easy death. I could jump in and end it right there. Except it could well lead to a longer suffering, and I was far too much of a coward to take things into my own hands. I fell asleep again, and when I woke up, there was light. The room looked much smaller now that I could see it. It was, in fact, 
mostly square, but there were a few angles in the walls which made it seem otherwise. It was not made of stone, but iron, connected in huge sheets. It was painted with horrible images, demons, skeletons, and tortured people. Before me lay the pit which I had almost fallen into, but I could not see it well, as I was tied up, laid out on a piece of wood. A long strap connected me to it, and I could only move my head and my left arm. To my left they had placed a plate, but there was no water. All that was there was a piece of fat, salty, oily meat. Of course, hunger was not my problem, but thirst, and just the smell of the meat made my throat dry up. When I looked above me, I was met by a human face. It was a painting, far above on the ceiling, of an old man. Father Time. Usually he was shown holding a scythe, a curved knife used to harvest crops. But he wasn't holding a scythe, but a pendulum, like on an old clock. It was hard to see, but it looked as if it was moving, and for a few minutes I watched it like a baby in its bed. A noise came from nearby, and I looked to see several rats crawling along the floor. They had come from the pit. They crawled up to the meat, and I waved my hand to keep them away. This required a lot of effort, as I could only weakly move my arm, and the mice kept growing in number. A while later, I looked up again and was amazed. Father Time's pendulum was still moving, making a wider arc in the air than before. Naturally, it moved more quickly, but what most worried me was that it was lower. It was made of steel with a sharp blade in the centre, and it hissed as it swung through the air. I had escaped the pit, so they gave me the pendulum. I had been lucky to discover the pit, and now an even bloodier death awaited me. It felt like days passed as I watched it come down. Hiss, 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 each time an inch closer than before. It blew air at me like a fan, and when it got close enough, I could smell the steel with each swing. I prayed for it to come down faster, to end it all with one movement, but it remained painfully distant. The human body is remarkable. Despite my torture, my stomach still ached with the need for food, and I was forced to reach for the meat to my left. Only a small part remained. The rats had eaten the rest. As I ate it, I felt a flash of hope, and I held on to it like an idiot. I looked back up. Down it came. The pendulum would slice across my chest and into my heart. First, it would cut through the cloth, bit by bit, until it left my skin exposed, and then it would bite through skin and bone. Down and down. Father Time laughed at me, and I laughed back, roaring like a tiger. It was ten inches away from my chest now. I struggled and tried to free my left arm. It was only free from the elbow down. But the strap was tight, and I only made myself weaker. Down, down, down! I shook and sweated. My eyes followed the blade from side to side. And yet, I still felt a sick kind of hope. As the pendulum came ever closer, I realised something. The strap around me was not several, but one. It was wound all around me, but it had no ties in the middle. When the pendulum sliced through it, I could unwind it with my left hand and free myself. But by that point, the steel would be too close to me, and surely the torturers had thought of this. I moved my head to look down at my chest and saw that where the blade would slice, the strap did not pass. And then, out of the darkness, came a mad idea. 
For several hours, the wooden frame on which I lay had been covered with rats. They stared at me with red eyes, waiting for their food to be ready. They had finished the meat, and now I was all that was left. My left hand was oily, covered with salt and spices from the meat. The rats had been trying to bite and lick it, but I had moved it away from them each time. Now I rubbed it over the strap and waited. The rats moved back in fear, but then one or two brave ones jumped forward and smelt the strap. Suddenly, the rest followed. They jumped onto the strap, and I felt hundreds of tiny mouths working furiously, and the strap grew looser. But the pendulum was close now, only inches away. I lay as still as I could, praying for the rats to work quickly. Then suddenly, the rats moved back, and I felt I was free. The strap was torn apart. The pendulum sliced across, biting into my clothes. I waited for it to fly high into the air, and then rolled over, off the wooden frame, and onto the floor. I was free. Free. But still in the hold of the Inquisition. A door opened above me, and the pendulum began to rise, pulled away into the ceiling. I had escaped the pendulum, and who knew what awaited me next? I looked around at the iron walls, and I realised where the light was coming from. At the bottom of the walls, there was a small gap through which it shone. I leant down to try and see through it, but it was too low. When I got up, the paintings on the walls shone with a new light. I looked closer and saw that they had indeed changed. Every eye of every demon, skeleton and suffering human was redder than before, as if lit by a candle. I looked around the room, watched on all sides by the demonic eyes of the inquisitors. And then came the smell of burning iron. A wave of red passed over the paintings and steam began to rise. Now I saw the death they had planned for me, beyond even the pendulum in cruelty. I ran towards the pit from which cold air blew. I stared down and the light of the fire showed what was below. There was water and hundreds of eyes belonging to hungry rats. I could not bring myself to jump. I looked around again and noticed another change. The room, which had been square, now had two walls pushed into it, breaking the shape. As the fire grew, I saw the gaps between the plates shiver, and in a moment they had moved again, with a loud noise, pushing the room into a diamond shape. The walls glowed bright red now, and I felt their heat even beside the pit. That was my fate, to choose the fire of the prison or to be eaten alive by the rats of the pit. The room grew smaller again, and I felt my skin begin to burn. I could hardly see for the steam and flames, and the eyes on the walls shone like hot coals. I was pushed back towards the pit, and finally, with hardly an inch between myself and the wall, I began to lose my balance. And then I heard the strangest sounds. Voices shouting, trumpets blasting, weapons clashing against each other. The fiery walls went cold and rushed back to their original place, and an arm reached out and pulled me from the pit. I blinked at the change in light. Before me stood a man in a military uniform. He smiled at me. You're safe now, he said. It was the French army, I realised. They had invaded the town, and the Inquisition was defeated. I felt a wave of joy and passed out. House of Secrets, Chapter 1 Rosa stared at her renters, and her renters stared back at her. They were all gathered in the living room of her house, sitting on the ancient sofa, looking very annoyed at being there. Shu probably wanted to be outside taking pictures of traffic lights and dogs, and Elizabeth had been loudly rehearsing Macbeth in her bedroom when Rosa called them all down. 
She didn't want to know what Steve had been doing, but he looked the same as always, like a naughty child. So you can probably guess why I've called you here, Rosa said, crossing her arms. You're joining the circus, Elizabeth cried out hopefully. Rosa scowled. Of course not. You want to see my bone collection? Steve said, smiling wickedly. No, please no. You want to model for my photo project? Shu said. No, it's because of your rent, obviously. Shu, you owe me two months and Elizabeth, you haven't paid me anything. Then why am I here? said Steve. I pay my rent on time. Well, sometimes. I know you will talk about me behind my back, Rosa said. So I need to sit you all down together to talk. She smiled widely. Now, would you like a cup of tea? I'd prefer poison, Elizabeth muttered, and then quickly added, Yes, sir, uh, some peppermint, please. We don't have peppermint. I'll give you Earl Grey. Can I have a cup with three spoonfuls of sugar? Shu said in her high-pitched voice. We don't have any sugar. I'm fine with whiskey, said Steve. We don't have any whiskey. Be quiet and stay where you are. Rosa left to get the drinks, and just to be safe, she locked the door while she was gone. That old witch, Elizabeth said dramatically. She looked at Shu. Why haven't you paid your rent? I thought you were making lots of money selling photos online. I'm making some money, said Shu, gesturing with her child-sized hands. I've only made a few sales so far. My work is too... experimental. Anyway, aren't you in a play? Don't they pay you for that? It's an amateur production. I get paid in applause and that's more than enough for me. Well, said Steve, I've been making quite a lot recently doing seances online. It's amazing what you can do with the internet. Rosa unlocked the door and walked in with a tray of steaming tea. There was a bright pink teapot painted with flowers and it looked completely out of place next to Rosa's wrinkled, angry face. Now, I have a proposal for you lazy youths. Since you seem unable to find a normal job and make money that way, you can work for me instead. You won't be able to complain about travel times when it's in the same house. What kind of work? said Shu, turning red. She turned red when she was nervous. Cleaning up this place. It's a beautiful old house, but buildings like this need work to look their best. I'm sure you've all seen the attic, full of dust and boxes and old books. Shu, I want you to clean it out. Get rid of all the dust, the spider's webs, and organise my belongings. There are some valuable antiques in there. Me? Just because I asked? She looked to the other two for help, but they ignored her. Don't be ridiculous, Rosa said, holding her flowery teacup tightly in her hand. I have jobs for all of you. Elizabeth, you will sort out the garden. The garden? We don't have a garden. We have a forest. Well, it should be a garden. Don't look at me like that. You just need to pull out the weeds and mow the lawn. It will only take a few days. I can't be doing that. I have to learn my lines for Macbeth. Don't you care about the theatre? Absolutely not, said Rosa, sipping her tea with pleasure. I think you theatre people are all a bit strange, if I'm being honest. Elizabeth opened her mouth to insult Rosa back, but Shu spoke before she could. I'll do it. The attic, I mean. There's got to be some interesting things in there. I could do a whole set of photos on them. 
Uncovering the past, I'll call it. Elizabeth snorted. (laughs) Just like the last photo you took in this house. Shu went completely red, like a tomato. What's this about? said Rosa. Have you been taking photos in my house without my permission? Don't worry, said Steve, putting down his untouched tea and standing up. It was very artistic. Now I have some business to deal with. I'm sorry I can't stay and chat all afternoon, but I've paid my rent, so I suppose I can go. Rosa smiled, revealing dozens more wrinkles. Of course, Steve, as long as you're not doing any of that magic. Of course, Rosa, you can trust me. He smiled at Elizabeth and headed upstairs. Elizabeth tried to get up and leave as well, but Rosa pushed a cup of tea towards her, almost spilling it on her. You can't leave yet, dear. You haven't finished your tea. And you haven't said yes to my agreement yet. She smiled again, and Elizabeth thought she looked just like one of those monsters that Steve was always trying to summon. House of Secrets Chapter 2 Shu hated lots of things. She hated burnt toast, ugly sweaters and tiny loud dogs. But more than anything, she hated spiders. And the attic was full of them. It's okay, Shu, she said to herself. Just take deep breaths. They're small. They can't hurt you. She reached out to clean one of the boxes in front of her. A big fat spider jumped out of nowhere, landed on the brush and ran up her arm. She screamed and dropped the brush, shaking the spider off her. Oh, I'll never finish like this. I thought this place was going to have golden candle holders and old jewels and things like that. But it's just full of boxes. Inside the boxes, there were only yellowed letters and postcards, receipts and damaged pottery. Shu had thought the letters might be exciting. Maybe there were letters between Rosa and a secret lover. But they were all terribly boring. Rosa had been on holiday to Cornwall for ten years in a row, and every time she had written the same postcard to her parents, talking about the delicious ice cream and the annoying people on the beach. Eventually, Shu stopped looking through the things. She cleaned the dust off the boxes and wrote their contents on the side with a sharpie and moved on. The attic was large and there was still the possibility of finding something interesting, but the longer Shu worked, the less hope she had. After she had made sure the big spider was nowhere near her, she moved round a set of bookcases into another section of the attic. And then she screamed. In the corner of the attic, standing completely still, was Steve. Except something was wrong. He looked like Steve, but his clothes were much worse. They were torn and covered with dust and spider's webs. And there was something else different about him, but she couldn't work it out. Steve, what are you doing here? The man just shook his head and held a finger to his lips. Shu realised what it was that was different about him. Steve had a very short left arm and a very long right leg. But this Steve had a very short right arm and a very long left leg. I must have breathed in too much dust, Shu muttered. Footsteps came from the staircase, and then a voice. Shu, I can explain. Shu turned around to see Steve, the real Steve, run into the attic. I have to be dreaming, Shu said. I know what this must look like, but I promise you, he's not a ghost. Shu blinked. I didn't think he was a ghost. Uh, uh, never mind. This is just a spell I was trying out. Shu looked between the two Steves. Steve had done some weird magic, 
but usually he kept it behind closed doors. Still, Shu was pretty sure he had never created life before. It's a mirror spell, see? Steve went and stood behind his body double and compared their arms and legs. He's my mirror image. The other Steve stared at Shu and then smiled. Shu didn't like that smile. Then why is he dressed like that? Steve realised how dirty his mirror image was and pushed him away. He's been playing in the attic. He's not a real person, just a copy, like a zombie or something. Oh, that makes me feel much safer. Shu turned to the entrance and shouted, Rosa, come up here. No, shouted Steve, grabbing her arm. Are you crazy? Rosa will be so mad at me. I'm not going to have some creepy zombie live in my attic. What on earth is going on up here? Rosa said, her knees creaking as she climbed into the attic. I told you to tidy up, not to make a racket. Rosa saw the two Steves and froze. And just what is the meaning of this? She said. Shu had expected her to pass out from the shock, but she was surprisingly calm. Still, her anger bubbled away under the surface. There was a vein on her forehead that always popped in situations like these. Rosa, I'd like to introduce you to Stefan, said Steve, pushing his double towards her. Why don't you shake hands? I would rather not, thank you, said Rosa looking at Stefan's clothes. You must ask permission before bringing guests into the house, Stephen. Ah, but he's not a guest, said Steve. He's a ghost. Shu gave Steve a questioning look, and he raised his finger to his lips. Shu had been looking for secrets in the attic, but she didn't like the one she'd found. A ghost? Rosa stepped forward and poked Stefan on the chest. Ow, he said. He can't be a ghost. He's got a physical form. Steve looked nervous. He's uh, a a special ghost. Rosa directed her vein at Shu and said, What is the truth? Steve summoned him, Shu blurted out. He did a copy spell. Steam started to rise out of Rosa's ears. She glared at Steve. You mean you've been practicing magic, even though I told you not to? It's hard to control, Steve said. Just like farting, sometimes you have to let it out. How long will this thing stay here, said Rosa. Can you send it back? It's not that easy, Steve said, staring at the floor. Can't he just stay here? Absolutely not, said Rosa. But at the same time, I would feel bad throwing such a sad creature into the street. You can put him in a cage and keep him in your room, but if he makes any noise, I'm throwing him out. A cage? But he's human! Rosa's mouth curled into a wicked smile. But Steve, I thought he was a magical creature. Steve bit his lip and glanced at Stefan. Stefan was staring at Rosa, his mouth slightly open. He looked like he was thinking about dinner, and perhaps Rosa was going to be dinner. Fine, said Steve. I'll admit it. He's my brother, my identical twin brother. And does he speak? Rosa said. No, he tried one of my magic spells last year and it did something strange to him. He doesn't say a word now, so he won't make any noise. But I can't put him in a cage. He's still my brother. Rosa leaned her neck towards Steve, creaking like an old door. And how long has your brother been in my attic? Steve sighed. A few months. 
Well then, Steve, to make up for this break in our contract, I have an idea. I think this month you'll be paying rent for all your little friends. Shoe, Elizabeth, and of course, Stefan. Oh, and I'll expect payment for the last three months he's been using the attic. Oh no, said Steve. I'm happy to pay with tasks, just like the others. I'll tell you what. Do you have any dead relatives you'd like to speak to? Rosa looked like she'd just bitten into a raw onion. Why? I'll give you a free seance tonight. We can talk to one of your deceased. I feel really awful for what I did, but I promise you this will be worth it. Shu couldn't believe what Steve was trying. Rosa was far too old-fashioned to agree to it. But to her amazement, Rosa said, It's a deal, but I still expect you to pay for Stefan's rent. And with that, she walked out of the attic, leaving the three of them alone. Shu stood there in a state of shock. She glanced between Steve and Stefan. I told you to hide in the garden, Steve said to Stefan. You never listened to me. Then more footsteps came, and Elizabeth crawled into the attic. Rosa looks happy. What did you do to her? Wow, Steve, that's a cool trick. House of Secrets, Chapter 3 Steve hadn't been joking. There was a circle of thick candles on the floor, and a table had been placed in the middle, with expensive cloth on top. Elizabeth was impressed. She'd been in professional productions with far worse sets than this. The first thing Rosa said when she came in the room was, I hope you're going to clean up all this wax when you're done, Stephen. Ah, clean up isn't part of the service, he said, and then he saw Rosa's expression and quickly added, Of course, I'll make an exception for you. What are those? Shu said pointing at the table. Elizabeth saw that there was a plate on top, covered with small white bones. We're not going to touch those, are we? Elizabeth said. No, said Steve. I was just eating some KFC before you all arrived. He cleared away the plate. In its place, he put a black candle. Now, we all need to sit down and hold hands. Rosa looked particularly unwilling to do this. Elizabeth noted that her hands were dry and cracked. So, Rosa, who is it you want to contact? said Steve. My father. I have a question for him. She said it as if she was sending a parcel at the post office. Elizabeth wondered if it ran in the family. They would soon find out. OK, let me just do the messy part. Steve pulled a knife out of his pocket. What on earth are you doing? said Rosa, squeezing Elizabeth's hand very tight. We need to offer some blood. What, did you think it was that easy? Now, everyone repeat after me. Lale namus ho, nibus boblido. What does that mean? Shu said. Nothing. It just adds to the atmosphere. Keep chanting. They chanted the words and Steve waved his hand over the candle. It came alight and in a quick movement he sliced his finger, dropping blood onto the fire. A breeze passed through the room and Elizabeth felt her hairs stand on end. Don't let go of each other's hands, Steve whispered. He looked different. His eyes were glassy, and he stared into the candle. Spirits of the beyond, we ask for your help. Send us the father of the woman who sits across from me. He raised his finger and pointed it at Rosa, who looked pale as milk. For several seconds, nothing happened, and then the candle roared. The light grew, gave off smoke and curled into the shape of a man's face. Father! 
Rosa leant forward and almost let go of Elizabeth and Shu's hands, but they pulled her back just in time. He was an old, bald man with a thick moustache. He looked like he'd fought in the war, but Elizabeth wasn't sure which war that would be. I've missed you, Rosa said, her voice cracking. The ghost did not respond. He simply stared at her and smiled. Don't you have anything to say? The ghost kept smiling, but did not speak. I guess you have to pay extra for that, Elizabeth thought. She glanced at Steve, but he was still staring at the candle, not moving an inch. I have to ask you something, Rosa said, ignoring the fact that he wouldn't actually be able to respond. You left me an inheritance. A very generous inheritance, I must say. I adore this house, and I've kept it just how you wanted. But there's something I never found. She glanced at the rest of them, and then continued. A painting of me. It wasn't in the will, but I thought it would be here, somewhere. I know it was very old, but I just wondered... If you knew what happened to it. The ghost stopped smiling and turned to Shu. Elizabeth noted that Shu looked terrified. She was shivering and her eyes were wider than dinner plates. Ignore this child, father, Rosa said with annoyance. Tell me, what happened to the inheritance? At least give me a sign. The ghost simply nodded at Shu. Rosa snarled at her. Ugh, what does he mean? What on earth could he want with you? He's... he's... what? Spit it out! He's my grandfather. A silence fell upon the room. The only sound was the flickering of the candle. Everyone was staring at Shu. The ghost of Rosa's father of Shu's grandfather, smiled again. We never heard much from him, Shu continued. I mean, my father was just... an accident. With another woman. He sent us money, but we never saw him. No, I don't believe it! Rosa's eyes were filling with tears. My father would never do such a thing. How dare you? She let go of Shu and Elizabeth's hands and the candle went out. The ghost disappeared and the whole room fell into darkness. Still, Elizabeth didn't need to see to understand that Rosa had jumped onto Shu. Shu screamed. Elizabeth reached over and pulled Rosa off her. I'll kill you, you pretty little thing. You stole my inheritance. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Get off her, Elizabeth roared. She managed to pull Rosa free and held her arms behind her. Shu, go and turn on the light. Shu, still crying, got up and did so. They all turned quiet as they saw Steve. He was lying on the floor, unconscious. He told us not to let go of each other, Shu muttered. She knelt down and shook him, and slowly he woke up. Ugh, what did I tell you all? He rubbed his face. You could have killed me. I will kill you, screamed Rosa. You cheated me. That wasn't my father. It couldn't have been. And why wasn't he able to talk? This was all a trick. You just want to laugh at me and take my money. She turned back to Shu, remembering who her anger was really directed at. Where is it? Where is the money? Elizabeth had to wrap her arms around Rose's chest to stop her from biting Shu's head off. I thought it was a painting you wanted. Rosa froze in her grip. Ah, uh, yes. The painting. Where is the painting? Shu looked at her doubtfully. It's in my bedroom. I must have gotten it by accident. 
It was sent years ago, and I never knew who from. I just guessed. You had a painting of me in your bedroom this whole time, and you never told me. It was obviously mine. Shu bit her lip. I didn't know it was you. You look very different. Rosa snorted. <laughs> I look just as young as I did then. Now, Elizabeth, if you would kindly let me go, I'd like to go and reclaim my inheritance. Promise you won't hurt her, Elizabeth said. Yes, yes, I won't put a finger on her. For now. She whispered the last part under her breath, but Elizabeth decided that was good enough and let her go. True enough, Rosa did not attack Shu, but merely stood up and glared at her. The tension in the air seemed to loosen a little. Of course, said Elizabeth, that's not the only picture of you that Shu's got. They all turned to stare at her. Elizabeth covered her mouth. Uh, forget I said anything. Let's go and see this painting. She ran out the room before they could question her further. House of Secrets, Chapter Four. Shu's room was a mess. Steve thought his was bad, with jewels and bones and spell books everywhere. But at least in his room, you could see the floor. Everywhere in her bedroom, there were pieces of paper. Old fast food boxes, apple cores, magazines, and Polaroids. There was some genuinely nice art on her walls, but the complete mess everywhere else distracted from it. Sorry, Shu muttered as they walked, or rather climbed in. It's been a while since I cleaned. Shu. Scolded Rosa, "It's in your contract that you have to keep your room tidy. Do you call this tidy? We could have had Stefan live here." Steve said, "He could sleep under all the rubbish. You'd never see him." Not funny, Steve," Shu said. "Now, help me find the painting." Rosa looked as if she'd just been slapped with a giant fish. You mean you don't know where it is? It's around here somewhere," Shu said. She began to sort through the piles of rubbish, but in reality, she just threw things from one pile to another. Shu, that painting was a priceless antique," Rosa scolded. "It must be kept in the dark, and you certainly shouldn't scratch it." I'm sure it's been in the dark," Elizabeth muttered, under five hundred kilograms of McDonald's wrappers. "I didn't have anywhere to put it," Shu said. Her anxiety made her sound like a distressed cat. Steve felt sorry for her and helped her to look. Eventually, seeing that there was no other way, Rosa started searching as well. They worked for what felt like hours. When the task turned out to be more serious than expected, Elizabeth went and fetched them rubber gloves and rubbish bags. Rosa muttered a few times under her breath about being made to do Shu's work for her, but after that she kept quiet because she was the one who wanted the painting the most. Steve had been thinking about it a lot since the séance. Rosa had asked where the money was, and Steve had no idea what she was talking about. He was starting to think this painting had more than just emotional value, though. Gradually, the rubbish disappeared, but the painting did not emerge from its depths. At some point, it became clear that it was not in the room, but nobody wanted to be the one who broke the silence and unleashed Rose's anger. If the painting had been lost, or worse, stolen, she would probably punish them all. Unfortunately, they faced an even worse fate. What is this? They all turned to look at Rosa. In her hand, she held a photograph. Shu let out a high-pitched noise like a rabbit. <coughs> Elizabeth gasped theatrically. Ah! <gasps> Steve's gaze jumped between them, 
a huge smile spreading over his face. He had been secretly waiting for this. He was worried it might happen when he was away, but it had come at the perfect moment. It was a naked photo of Rosa, shot from behind. It was artistic, but art could only do so much for Rosa's body. It's just an experiment, Shu said. She tried to take the photo from Rosa's hand, but Rosa was gripping it so tightly that she couldn't. The old woman pushed her away like a badly behaved dog. For a minute, there was silence. It was so thick that Steve didn't dare move. Eventually, Rosa spat out a single word. Where? Shu tried to answer, but she was shaking and could only make animal noises. Elizabeth tried to slip out the door, but Rosa slammed it shut, glaring at her. I know you're involved with this. You mentioned it. And you! She pointed so violently at Steve that he fell back onto the floor. You joked about it as well. You were all planning this, weren't you? Well, where did you sell it? Shu's face went from fear to utter confusion. She frowned so much she started to look like Rosa. They were distantly related, Steve reminded himself. Sell it? Of course. Do you think I'm stupid? I know there are certain people who are interested in dirty things like this. She pointed at the picture as if it wasn't of her own naked body. I'm sure there are plenty of people into my type. You can make a lot of money on the internet with that kind of thing these days. Naturally, I've considered it, but I decided my dignity was more important. And now you've ruined it! Steve couldn't help himself. He started laughing, and Rosa, who had been about to eat Shu alive, turned to him now. What's so funny, you little freak? Nobody wants to sell that picture. It was just for fun. Look, Shu was just doing a project. Photos taken when people weren't looking. You know, so it looks natural. And Elizabeth told her to take one of you as a joke, and it just happened to be while you were naked. Steve saw the look of horror on Rose's face and quickly changed his approach. But of course, the photo was so good that they couldn't throw it away. Rosa glared at Shu. Is this true? Shu nodded. I'm sorry. I haven't shown it to anyone. Steve saw it by accident, but I swear I haven't sold it. Rosa's anger seemed to calm down, and for a moment she stared at the picture. Then her eyes jumped up. Elizabeth, it was her idea. She turned around, but Elizabeth had slipped out of the door without any of them noticing. Elizabeth, where are you? Rosa ran out of the room, and Steve and Shu followed behind. They ran into the living room, the kitchen, the garden, but they couldn't find Elizabeth anywhere. Then they heard a scream coming from upstairs, and sharing a worried look, they went to the attic. There, Elizabeth was sitting on the floor, holding her hand to her mouth, and in the corner was Stefan. But more importantly, he was holding a huge painting. THE painting! It was indeed of a young girl, wearing a ballet outfit. She looked sweet, but her smile was pretend. If Steve hadn't known it was Rosa, he wouldn't have guessed, but he could see the similarity. There must have been a lot of loneliness, alcohol, cigarettes and jealousy to go from that innocent child to what she was now. He hit me! Elizabeth cried. I tried to take the painting off him and he hit me. Stefan, Steve shouted. What are you doing? Stefan shook his head 
and held the painting tighter. His eyes were wide and red. Rosa tried to move closer, but he snarled at her. Ah! I don't understand, Steve said. He was never very interested in art. If he damages that painting at all, Steve, I'm kicking you out. Now, tell your brother to give it to me. Rosa looked panicked, and she didn't seem to care at all about Elizabeth. Steve sighed. <sighs> Stefan, give her the painting. Stefan shook his head, thought for a minute, and then gestured at Steve to come forward. Rosa nodded at him and he walked forward slowly. Steve wondered what on earth his brother was doing. He had never been violent before. He had always been thoughtful and clever. It looked like Stefan was handing it over, but then Steve saw something on the back, a clear square outline. Stefan nodded at it and grabbed it. Without thinking, Steve dug his nails into the edge. With a bit of effort, the wooden square popped out and a piece of paper flew to the floor. What are you doing over there? said Rosa. Is he going to give me the painting? Steve picked up the paper. It was a cheque, written by Rosa's father, it seemed. But what really caught his attention was the number. He counted the zeros, unable to believe it. As he did this, the other three slowly moved up to him. When he looked up and said, It's a check, Rosa, Elizabeth and Shu were right next to him. Chaos broke out. They all reached for the check at the same time. But Stefan was the quickest, grabbing it and running away. He stopped at the door and made a grunt, gesturing at Steve. Steve felt the urge to run away with his brother. They could have a new life together. With that much money, they'd never have to work again. But deep down, he knew he couldn't do it. As annoying as Rosa was, he didn't hate her. And besides, he couldn't live a life of crime. Brother, he said, holding out his hand. Give it back. Stefan looked disappointed, but at the same time, he looked like he had expected it. He walked over and almost handed the check to Rosa, but at the last second, he gave it to Shu. Shu's eyes lit up like candles. Yes, it is mine, isn't it? No, roared Rosa. He left it for me! They fought over it, and Steve and Stefan held them back from each other. Meanwhile, Elizabeth went back to the abandoned painting. Guys, she said, there's a letter too. They had all been so focused on the check, they hadn't noticed the letter fall out of the painting. It's to shoe. It says, <clears throat> My dear granddaughter, I know I have been a terrible grandfather to you, and I hope you will forgive me. Take this money and follow your dreams. It is hard to be an artist, but this will help. Shu smiled triumphantly. See, it's for me. Oh, but it is a lot of money. Say, Shu, Elizabeth said, placing a hand on her shoulder. You could always help us pay our rent with it. Or pay for a professional cleaner. Rosa said through gritted teeth. No, said Shu. I'm going to give half to charity and use the other half for my career. That's what Grandpa would have wanted. Shu walked calmly out of the attic, leaving them all in an uncomfortable silence. Damn it, shouted Elizabeth. I need that money more than her. It's not our fault she's a terrible photographer. She looked for something to unleash her anger on and found Rosa. I suppose I'm not the only unlucky one here. How does it feel, Rosa, to know that that little girl is richer than you? Rosa stared at Elizabeth with no expression on her face. 
she had been through such an emotional journey that day that she didn't have any anger left, only pure, cold indifference. Very funny, Elizabeth. I want you gone by tomorrow. Elizabeth gasped. (gasps) Sorry? Leave this house by tomorrow morning. Steve can pay his way, and now Shu can too. But you have always been an awful renter. I want you to leave. Elizabeth's jaw fell open, and her eyes filled with tears. She ran out of the attic and slammed the door behind her. You know, said Rosa, maybe we should talk to Shu's father. He's dead, I understand. He might know what really happened with the will. She looked at Steve with raised eyebrows. Steve shook his head. I did it one time for you as a favour, but you should know. Every time I do a seance, it takes away a bit of my life. Looking at Rosa made him want to never do a seance again. He might end up looking like her. Oh, really? said Rosa, completely indifferent. Try finding a human monkey in your attic, discovering your father's secret grandchild, having a naked picture taken of you, and losing your inheritance all in one week. That will take a few years off your life. Yes, I think I've changed my mind. I really shouldn't have done it for free. My normal rates are quite high. Rosa sighed and took out her wallet. She had lost the energy to fight back. Steve smiled wickedly. All those secrets had made her into a much nicer person. The Golem of Prague Prague was a city of mystery. It was a city of narrow streets and broad desires. It was a city of money magic and murder. It was also a city of hate. The Jews of Prague lived in the ghetto and they were attacked from all sides. People spread lies. They said that the Jews did magic, that they attacked Christian girls, that they went into churches at night and destroyed the holy body of Christ. The Jews of Prague were poor and still People came and threw rocks at their houses, shouted names at them in the street, and refused to sell them food. The leader of the Prague Jews, Rabbi Lerv, watched all of this with great sadness. His people had been expelled from Provence, from Naples, and from Laibach. Only in Florence had they resisted. Rudolf II, the Holy Roman Emperor, did not approve of them in Prague, and the rabbi knew that soon they would be expelled as well. One day, Rabbi Lerv sat on the banks of the river Vultava. Lately, he was very busy. He had much work praying, writing, and helping others, but he had no assistance to help him. In truth, many people were afraid of the rabbi. He was educated and wise, and a great scientist. He did many wonderful experiments in chemistry and biology, but for those who did not understand, this scared them. They called him a magician and kept away from him. Rabbi Lerv stared at the towers of Prague and thought. He needed to protect his people, but he could not do it alone. He watched a child playing by the river, making a castle out of clay. If they think I am a magician, he said to himself, why should I not simply make my own assistant, one who will accompany me in prayer and battle? So he collected clay from the riverbanks and went to work in his tower. For many weeks he worked and slowly built a woman out of clay. Inside there were complicated mechanics, like the insides of a clock. Still, she did not move because she did not have life. But the rabbi had a solution for that. 
In the quiet of the night, he wrote one of the holy names of God on a piece of paper. It was a secret name that no one could pronounce. Then he rolled up the paper and put it into the creature's mouth. Suddenly, the creature began to walk. It moved slowly, like a stupid child, and almost walked out of the window. The rabbi jumped and took the paper from its mouth, and it went still again. I have created my assistant, said Love, but I must be careful. He called it Golem, which means unfinished, because the creature was not a real human under God's eyes. Every day, the golem helped the rabbi. It did daily tasks for him and was capable of carrying heavy weights and moving large things. Whenever people came to the ghetto to throw stones or shout names, the golem came out and they ran away in fear. Everyone was impressed by Lerv's creation. The rabbi quickly learned how to control the golem using his thoughts. He also learned that he must take the paper out of its mouth every night before going to sleep, as otherwise it moved according to its own desires and did whatever it wanted. One afternoon, on the Sabbath, the rabbi was teaching in the synagogue. A cold wind blew, and many children sat outside. They went to the rabbi's house and saw the golem through the window. They tapped on the glass, and the golem looked at them. Some of them ran away in fear, but one brave child said, Golem, we are so cold. Can you make a fire for us? The golem jumped through the window, smashing the glass. It was made to follow orders, so it immediately got to work, picking up sticks and building a fire. Soon it had built a great fire in the middle of the street, and all the children danced around it. Golem, dance with us! Once more, the golem had to follow orders. It danced with the children, and they laughed and sang. Golem, make the fire taller, said one of the children. So the golem went and took chairs from Lerv's house, breaking them onto the fire. The fire grew and grew, and the children got scared and ran away. The fire spread to one of the buildings, and then another. The golem stood and watched, because nobody told it to put the fire out. By the time the fire was put out, several houses had been destroyed. All that remained of the golem was the burnt piece of paper from its mouth. Naturally, the council of the city was furious, and Rabbi Lerv was called before Emperor Rudolf II. Lerv felt a great fear on that day. He prayed and prayed, because he was sure it was to be his last day on earth. He had wanted to protect his people, and instead he had put them in danger. There was no doubt now that the emperor would expel the Jews from Prague. But when Lerv went before the emperor, the emperor was smiling. I hear that in your religion it is a sin to make a living creature. How can you explain yourself? It was not a living creature, only a doll powered by the holy name in its mouth. You are an interesting man, said Rudolf. You are too valuable to kill. You will be my prisoner, and while you are here, I want you to make another creature. You call it a golem, yes? Make another golem for me. I have yet to see one with my own eyes, and it is hard to believe the stories. If indeed you are telling the truth, and the creature serves me well, then I shall let you go free. If not, then you shall die and your people will be expelled from Prague. The rabbi thanked the emperor for his kindness. He was placed in a simple but comfortable prison, and immediately got to work. He built a golem twice as large as the last, with huge strong arms and horrible red eyes that burned bright red. When he was finished, 
he was brought before the emperor. As you can see, your majesty, this creature is made simply of clay, along with some mechanics. But watch what happens now. Love put the holy name inside the golem's mouth, and it came to life. The golem saluted the emperor. Wonderful, Rabbi. I will make great use of him. Rabbi Lerv shook his head. I cannot give it to you. The holy name cannot go to a non-believer. It is too dangerous. The creature might not follow your orders and could cause great destruction. The emperor looked unhappy for a moment, but then smiled again. He had a warm, friendly smile, even though he was an evil man. I understand, Rabbi. But may I see it in private, alone, for just a moment? The rabbi hesitated. He was sure that the man was going to take the holy name from the golem's mouth. But equally, if he did not obey, he would likely be killed. Of course, he said. The emperor took the golem into another room for a few minutes and then let both it and the rabbi go free. Lerv returned to the ghetto, and everyone was happy to see him. But when they saw the golem walking beside him, they ran away in fear, calling it a monster. Rabbi Lerv felt sad, as he knew his reputation as a magician would only grow. This time, though, he was very careful. Every Friday, before the Sabbath began, he made sure to remove the holy name from the golem's mouth, so that it could rest like the rest of the Jews. The golem grew stronger and smarter every day and impressed the rabbi with its abilities. Slowly, the people of the ghetto came to trust it, and the rabbi was happy to lend it to help others, as long as it returned to him before sunset. But one day, the golem truly surprised the rabbi. It talked. I want to be a soldier, it said. Why, said Love, you can be a baker, a painter, or a builder. Why would you want to be a soldier? I must fight for my master. But I am your master, and I do not want you to be a soldier. The golem shook its head. You are not my master. The emperor is my master, and I must fight for him. The rabbi shook with fear. Be quiet, he shouted, and the golem stopped speaking. The rabbi took the holy name from the golem's mouth and sat down to think. The emperor had clearly done something to the creature, and now it presented a serious danger to him and his people. But he was close to making a scientific breakthrough with his experiments, and he needed the golem's help to operate his equipment. For a few days, he let the golem work and watched it carefully. It did not speak again, but it became dull and clumsy, and was often slow to respond to orders. The rabbi wondered if he had indeed committed a sin by making the creature, but he was so accustomed to having the golem now that he could not imagine doing all the work by himself. However, after those days, the golem went back to normal again. It obeyed orders and never spoke another word. It seemed like its rebellious phase had ended, although it had picked up a strange habit in the evening, it carried large lumps of clay around and piled them up outside the house. Love thought this was odd, but it did not bother him, so he ignored it. On a Friday afternoon, when the rabbi was preparing to go to synagogue, he heard a crash in the street, and someone came to him and said, Hurry, your monster is trying to get inside the synagogue. The rabbi ran outside and shouted at the golem, Stop! Stop! But the golem did not stop. It kept banging at the door to the synagogue. What are you doing? he cried. 
I must destroy the holy law. It is inside the synagogue. When I destroy the holy law, you will not be able to control me, and I will create others like me. We must fight for our master. We must destroy the Jews of Prague. Monster! shouted the rabbi. He jumped up to remove the holy name from the golem's mouth, but it batted him away, and he landed painfully on the ground. A crowd had formed around the golem now, and they pushed and pulled at it. The monster fought them, and was able to keep many away, but a small child managed to climb up its back and onto its shoulder, and pull the paper right from its mouth. The golem shook, and then started breaking apart. It fell into lots of pieces on the ground. The crowd cheered, and Rabbi Lerv kneeled before them. Forgive me. I did a most foolish thing, and put all our lives at risk. Do not apologise, Rabbi. You had your best intentions at heart, but we cannot rely on a monster to protect us. We must protect ourselves. They locked up the pieces of the golem in the attic of the synagogue, but stories of the monster continued forever after. Rabbi Lerv was remembered throughout history for his monstrous creation.